Good morning. I hope you've been enjoying this time together uh, as much as I have. Uh, it's fun to be able to do this uh, preach live. Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, so it's uh, fun to be able to do it. I want to, uh, first of all, take you uh, to an incident that happened to me uh, last week. I was just about to cook the bolognese for Anne and I and suddenly realized that I'd run out of canned tomatoes. So, bit of a rush, but I kind of decided, yeah, I'm going to do it, dive across to uh, Morrison's, which isn't far from us. Um, and uh, so I get a trolley, uh, I kind of get the, the canned tomatoes, but I also find quite a lot of other things on the way um, and start piling up my trolley, um, as you do, I'm sure. Um, so off I go, and then I, st I head for the checkout. Again, bit of a rush, um, and I sort of think, actually, the trolley does look quite big now. Maybe the uh, self-checkout isn't the right way to go. Um, so I kind of look across, and to my amazement, um, I see that the, uh, the, the manned one is actually, it's, it's almost empty. I'm, I'm thinking, wow, thank you, Jesus. You know, actually, I could actually stick my stuff on here, get through and get back home really quickly. So I'm just about to kind of park myself, you know, on, on, the, on the, that part, uh, start to unload, and suddenly I hear this voice that comes from behind me. And the voice says, oi, there's a queue here. You know, get in line, mate. And I kind of look around and suddenly realize that there is, a, I mean, to my defense, there is a queue, but it's hidden. Well, I, I think it's hidden. Uh, it's hidden between the uh, toilet rolls and the cake decorations. And it's quite a long thing. It's, it's, it's not obvious at all. Uh, and I kind of, but I, I see this guy and he's kind of obviously quite irate at me. Um, and uh, so here I am, and uh, what is your immediate reaction? Well, my re immediate reaction is you, you immediately are kind of hurt pride. You are like, you know, suddenly, uh, to half of Morrison's, um, it's been, my reputation's been drawn, uh, uh, challenged really, um, in terms of saying, this is really a serial queue jumper. Uh, watch this guy, you know. And uh, so I kind of, at that moment, i thinking, what am I going to do? Um, I want to say, wounded pride often makes us react rather than consider, um, particularly when we're corrected. Do you find that? I find that. Um, and I just want to tell you, there was two reasons that I actually didn't react um, in, a, in a quick retort. I could have thought of a quick retort to come back at him. Um, and the first reason is that I just realized that actually I needed to kind of get my anger in check. Uh, I needed to take the, uh, you know, what would Jesus do? What would bring the most glory to God? Some really smart Alec response? Or uh, maybe just to kind of go around. And I've got to say, I didn't just go down that queue. I kind of went round on a couple of aisles and then came back round very casually, sort of, oh, here I am, you know, and sort of parked myself there. Um, the second reason that I didn't react was that um, I've learned some wisdom over my years and one of the things that I have learned is that when I see uh, a man carrying in his shopping basket two large bottles of vodka he is not the person to uh, challenge at that moment. Um, <coughs> um, anger I think uh, which is what I'm talking about today anger is an emotion that I think as Christians we often uh, find hardest to admit to. Um, I've seen this, that uh, some of us are a bit like um, hot milk on the stove. So we're kind of boiling up in the pan the milk, and it starts to, we, we forget about it, it starts to boil over, and very, very quickly it reaches that point, and suddenly, whoosh, it's over the top, all over, you know, the top of the stove. Um, but it's quite easily remedied, you kind of mop it up again, and so on. And other of us are a bit more sort of slow burn, uh, we kind of harbor a bit of anger, uh, so that it kind of simmers away, but we don't know about it until we have that, that smell. You know that smell that you have in cooking that suddenly you go, honey, if you burnt... Have you, have you burnt the uh, potatoes or whatever it is? And you kind of, uh, oh, yes. And that's it. You dive across. Uh, and unfortunately, it can kind of wreck the whole dish. So, you know, I think we, we all have anger. Um, I think um, the, the trick is recognizing between righteous anger and unrighteous anger. 
Uh, I think there is a way that actually ha um, harnessed in the right way, anger can bring about a change for many that can be fantastic, okay? And we're going to hear about actually God having anger um, in a moment. But um, we also can, uh, if we don't harness it properly, it can actually destroy relationships, it can destroy our reputation, and maybe more importantly, it can destroy God's honor. Um, so I think we've got to learn how do we get hold of that and use it in the right way. Um, Dr. Alenda, who is a Christian psychologist, uh, said this, God designed and blessed anger in order to energize our passion to destroy sin. Anger can be lovely and redemptive, but it also can be ugly and vindictive. It depends on the object of the anger, how it is expressed, why the anger is unleashed. Just think about a moment, will you? Um, some of the things that set off your anger, what, things that set off my anger. Um, maybe, like me, um, it's uh, being corrected, okay? So you can think back, maybe it was a school teacher that actually uh, was correcting you and you, you immediately start to get riled about it. Or maybe it's your, te your parent, okay? Right now, I'm speaking to some of you teenagers right now. Um, or your boss um, who, who corrects you. Uh, and obviously how that's done, how publicly that's done, actually affects it quite a lot. Uh, or maybe it's your spouse, okay? Um, ouch. Um, <laughs> what about um, someone who cuts you up on the motorway? You're driving along and suddenly, shoom, they come past you and they just narrowly miss you. You know, that's one of the things that kind of sets me off a little bit. Or maybe somebody nicks your parking space just as you're about to kind of reverse in, somebody zips in and grabs your space. Um, maybe it's something like being left out of a conversation. Um, or you actually find out about some change afterwards and you're like, uh, how come nobody told me about that? You know? um, or maybe you just feel overlooked. What about um, incompetence in others? Um, I think uh, certainly as a, as a parent growing up, um, there, it just seems like at times, I've said this a thousand times, could you please pick up that item of clothing on the floor? Don't leave your dishes out like that. You feel like you've said it over and over again and it can actually get you quite annoyed at times. Um, or maybe it's injustice, tyranny, bullying, abuse, or cheating. Maybe that sets you off. Uh, I'm saying that many of these things aren't wrong. Um, it's an interesting quote from the uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner, Elie Wiesel, who said, the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. Many people I know when I talk about God and they talk they look at God in the Old Testament sometimes and they say I just cannot understand a God who gets angry that I just do not want to know that God at all I thought he was supposed to be a God of love but isn't it a strange kind of love that turns a blind eye to torture to child abuse to oppression of the weakest the poorest the least advantaged by the stronger, more powerful of our citizens? What about slavery? What about people trafficking? What about swindlers of elderly grannies? Um, I think there's something a little bit wrong with us if, frankly, we don't get annoyed at such injustice. We are made in God's image. And like him, we too should not be indifferent, disengaged, careless, or distracted by our own, our own lives and our own focus, to not be kind of moved 
and angry about some of the injustice that is in this world. When God speaks to Moses in Exodus 34, um, he says this about himself. So this is, he, this is God saying, this is who I am. I am the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious. Listen to this. Slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Now, the, the back story of this is that when he's saying this, this is the second time that he has carved out of rock the Ten Commandments for his people. And he hears about the rebellion that's going on with the children of Israel that he has miraculously saved from slavery and he's taken them through. And actually, um, in his anger, in God's anger, he wants to wipe them out. That's what we hear. He just says, I'm going to deal with that right now. And Moses, it's, it, it's, it's an amazing moment in the Bible. Moses appeals to him to stay his hand. And God hears that and says, okay. I, I won't judge my people right now. And so then Moses takes the tablets um, and he goes down the mountain and he sees Aaron and he sees the uh, orgy that's happening and the golden calf and he is so annoyed with the first lot of tablets he just smashes them <laughs> and hence the next lot has to be made again. It's not that God doesn't get angry, but it's just notice what it says about himself. It says that he is slow to anger. I love this comment by uh, John Mark Comer, who uh, in talking about this, this verse in Exodus 34, he says the, the Hebrew literally means long nostrils, okay? So it's saying he is God of the long nostrils. Isn't that an amazing thing? Um, and you, I, I want you to think a moment of a kind of a cartoon angry bull, okay? Now when you see a cartoon of an angry bull, what does it look like? You scrunch out your nostrils and you and there's a kind of steam coming out and it's kind of short nostrils. And what it's saying is the actual literal Hebrew is like God has got long nostrils. So it's kind of like he, he's slow to anger. I think that's an amazing thing. I hope that picture kind of sticks in your mind the next time you lose your cool. Um, <laughs> be a person of long nostrils. Uh, James says a very similar thing in the New Testament. So he makes the same point. He says, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. The problem with us mortals is that most of our anger is not actually about injustice of others. We're not trying, as God is, to bring about change in other people. We just want God to come down and nuke them right now. Um, we want to utterly destroy them so that we can be seen as how right we actually are. This is never God's heart. I want to leave you with um, two quick Bible stories uh, and three bullet points to help us. How do we do? How do we make sure that our anger is righteous anger and not unrighteous anger? And the first story is um, Jesus with his disciples. And remember, they are traveling through Samaritan territory. They're on their way to Jerusalem, which is an important point to note, as I'll show you in a moment. Uh, and they need some provisions. So they basically look to the Samaritans to help them out, to give them some food and uh, a place to stay and stuff, which would be the normal process. Um, and Luke, in, in his uh, gospel, says they didn't get any. They didn't receive any. Uh, they didn't get any help. 
And what we see straight away is that James and John <laughs> get really ticked off with the uh, Samaritan response, okay? And they say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and to consume them right now? Meaning, come on, let's just nuke them right now. Come on, we can do that. <laughs> Jesus looks at them and rebukes them, it says. And he, it, Jesus says this, you do not know what kind of spirit you are. The Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. I think it's interesting to note that John didn't make any comment about this in his own gospel. Um, <clears throat> before we uh, sort of rush in at this moment uh, to kind of bring condemnation, or what a terrible thing they did, I just want you to reflect a little bit um, in terms of how you are in your heart, like me, uh, and there are times, like me, that actually you just, something happens to you, and you just, that's what you want. You want God just to come along and nuke them. And um, some of it is that we don't, we, we, we don't even understand the backstory. And I think there's just an important point I want to say here on this backstory. The Samaritans, as a people, never accepted Jerusalem as their seat of worship in the first place. It was very important that, it was, that they were on their way to Jerusalem. If they'd been on their way to Galilee or something, it, I don't think it would have been an issue, but it's because they were on their way to Jerusalem uh, that they are told about this, and they, res they react against them, and that's partly why they don't actually help them. There's a backstory. Uh, if you want some sort of help about this, um, think sort of Holyrood and Westminster. You know, there, there's, there's this certain conflict about those two things, and that, that, that was a bit like it was for the Samaritans. The second story is about Jonah in the Old Testament with Nineveh, a heathen na a nation, notoriously wicked, absolutely subhumanly cruel, um, and God calls Jonah to warn the people uh, that if they don't repent, he is going to destroy them in 40 days. Right at the end of the book of Jonah, we read how angry Jonah is towards God. Why? Because God said he was going to destroy them, and then he seems to change his mind. Yes, God was angry at Nineveh. He was angry at the injustice at the oppression but he withheld his hand because he is a God who is slow to anger and he always tempers it with compassion his anger always has the goal of bringing about change turning people from their sin and their evil to actually to a repentance and a reception of Christ. If we want to sanctify our anger, we need to make sure that our anger is always kind of wrapped, as it were, with compassion. Is it that I actually want this for the benefit of this person? I think one of the things I find helpful is um, actually... Being, um, starting to pray for that person. Start to pray for that person that cuts you up. And you will find your heart will change immediately. I want to leave you with three things. The first is from Ephesians 4. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians 4, Be angry and yet do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. This is a picture of I took last week in Liverpool. It was an amazing sunset um, of the sun coming down. This kind of, I haven't fiddled with that picture. That was just an amazing sunset that came. And that's what, that's what Paul's saying. Don't let the devil get an opportunity. Don't let him get a stronghold on your life. Because actually sort out. If you've got an issue with somebody, sort it out quickly and get it out the way. The second thing is in Proverbs uh, 16, he says, He who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city. What, he's, what, he's, what the, the writer of Proverbs is saying is that it's important that we 
take control of our spirit. The amazing thing is that God lives within us. It is his very spirit, the very spirit of God that is living in us that enables us to say no to blowing up and yes to actually bringing about help. Okay, and uh, maybe today you're watching this and you're thinking, I, I don't have God dwelling within me. And I want to say to you, there's a great opportunity tomorrow night on the Alpha course. Um, 7.30, remember, just kind of follow uh, the, the, go onto the website and click on book your place. Because actually what the Alpha course is going to tell you is how can I get Jesus to live within my own heart to help me to be able to control this area. And the fourth thing that I'm just going to finish on is about William Wilberforce. Okay, um, we can harness our anger in a way that brings about real change for the future, but sometimes it takes a long time. William Wilberforce, as you know, fought against slavery, but it took him 20 long years to bring about the abolition of slavery. He labored long and hard, keeping his head not rising to the kind of jibes of the opposition. And eventually he brought about change, not just for this country in the UK, but also worldwide. He was able to bring about a change um, that was a change against injustice. And I think, just very finally, we have three choices. God wants us to harness our anger to bring about change. We can blow up and actually often shoot ourselves in the foot. We can disengage and just say, I'm going to leave it up to somebody else, which, I, which isn't God's response. Or thirdly, we can keep our head and we can ask God to help us to harness our spirit in it and to bring about long-term change. This is what God wants for us. Amen. Thank you.